Hi, and welcome again to the podcast. Today we talk with Emma, and as you'll see, she's very passionate about her topic. She is an undergrad currently studying at university, majoring in history, and minoring in ethics and ancient studies. The goal of this podcast is to interview scholars, enthusiasts, professors, amateurs, librarians, students, academics, and many more. And now it's time for some history, okay? Eh? So today we're with Emma, and she has a super interesting topic. I mean, all the topics are always really interesting, but this one, I don't know if she wants to introduce it. Absolutely. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so I adore Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. And Is this I, an open secret? Oh my gosh. <laughs> if, if you know me for more than 10 minutes, I will probably, you know, mention da Vinci in some shape or form. Okay. I, I adore him. Yeah. And when, when did this passion start? Oddly enough, through fiction... Okay. Nothing to do with history necessarily. Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. Yeah, sure. It was a really interesting introductory level, and then it just spurred this historical interest. In Where him. you're like, oh my gosh, I need to know what it actually is. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. like I didn't know he was so cool. He's so cool. He is such. A, he is an amazing man. <laughs> He's super cool. Yeah. yeah. I guess at that point we can just start right at the beginning. Yep. So 1470s. That's where we're at in the timeline. No? We'll start earlier? (laughs) We can start earlier if you want. I think it's really interesting to just have a quick look at his childhood. Sure. It really was so influential on his later life. Okay. So he was born April 15th in 1452, and he was, of course, in the province of Vinci, and he was illegitimate. His parents were not married, and his father's family, though, came from just this fairly long line of notaries. And had he been legitimate, I guess one could argue that he might have been strictly expected to become a notary, but he wasn't. So he didn't receive that kind of education necessarily to become a notary. He didn't receive a typical education that was, you know, almost expected of certain boys of certain classes, which was to learn the works of the uh, ancients. Texts like Galen, texts like Ptolemy. He didn't even really know Latin, which I mean, for shame. If you don't know Latin, gosh, you're nobody. She had a hard start then. Oh, uh, you know what? It wasn't a bad time to be illegitimate. It wasn't like he was shunned, but in a way, it had the best possible outcome because it opened up his mind to these other forms of education, which was observation and asking questions, mm-hmm. looking at the world around you and trying to deduce as much as you could from it. He had this childlike curiosity throughout his entire life. So he had an unconventional education, is what you're saying. In a way, yeah, it was, if he had been legitimate, it would have been completely different, but he wasn't. And then because of that, he found himself leaning on other sorts of skills. And also because of this, he wasn't reliant on the works of the the great fathers of antiquity. He didn't look at Aristotelian natural philosophy and go, oh, that has to be it. He was much more of a, oh, you know, I noticed this. How can I learn more about this? What experiments can I do to prove this? Regardless of whether or not it corresponded with Aristotelian or Galenic or Ptolemaic science. So he really didn't fit in a mold. Exactly. He, he wanted to learn for the sake of learning. He didn't want to learn to correspond with whatever anyone else was saying. It had an exponential repercussions throughout his life. And you can see that those same qualities reappearing in everything that he did for, throughout his entire life. So after childhood, his father, Piero da Vinci, you know, used his influences and got him into the workshop of Andre um, del Verrocchio. And again, I'm not an expert. Mm-hmm. I'm just guessing at Italian pronunciation. But it was a really significant workshop to work in. It was really beneficial apprenticeship. And, and what was he doing in this workshop? He was learning. Learning art, in learning engineering, learning all these little tricks of the trade. Because Verrocchio had a very, quite possibly innovative approach to art and what an artist could be in Florence, Italy. Because, you know, that's what marked Florence throughout the Renaissance. Florence was a center of artistic innovation and inspiration. And it's where we get so many brilliant artists from there. And Verrocchio's workshop was a place where, you know, that sort of innovation and change and, and artistic endeavorments was encouraged. So they were a good match. It, it, they were. And it was actually, Verrocchio's workshop was actually given this really um, phenomenal commission to put this two-ton dome atop of the Florence Cathedral. And that's that infamous cathedral that marks the skyline of any tourist photo of Florence. It was, the dome itself was built by Brunelleschi, I believe. 
And the dome itself, I think, was made of just like bricks, but the little sphere on top, that was made out of metal. And that required feats of engineering that weren't common at the time. It was a really big feat of art and engineering, art and science, and that kind of mixture really inspired da Vinci. And he would mention, and he would refer back to that project throughout his life. It was really influential. And if you look at his artwork throughout the rest of his life, you see these mixes of art and science. And maybe that working at Verrocchio's workshop at that time, that introduction to those various aspects of art and science and how science could be art and art could be science were really consequential. Because things had started to split off where art was in its own corner and science was in its own corner according to the greats. Exactly. I think it was a pretty strict divide, memory serves. Yeah. In that time, this was a bit of a, a turmoil that da Vinci was yeah. into. I mm-hmm. think, yeah, you know, but he was, he took everything in stride. I think. Like, if you look at his character, he was a homosexual, and he moved through life never really appearing to be ashamed of it. He was just taking it as is, and I think he had that same approach to his art and his science. He was taking it as it is. There was no hesitation. I mean, I've always imagined him as a really kind, warm man. Mm-hmm. Just like that kind of person who, you know, you'd meet on the street, and you'd have a really nice conversation with. And this is not nothing, you know, necessarily rooted in historical study. That's just how I always pictured him. Mm-hmm. Sort of like, you know that movie? Ever After? Like Ever After? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have to mention that movie because yeah. Da Vinci was awesome. Yes. The actor in there was incredible. Exactly. Yeah. He was like a little bit quirky, yes. but just such a great guy. Yeah. And I think that's how I always pictured him. It was as that wise, but really kind-hearted mm-hmm. and, and kind of eccentric, comfortable man. He did seem eccentric with the things that he's created or the ideas he had. Yeah. When we look at his works now, I mean, mm-hmm. we kind of see the progression of his works. But at the beginning, did he have a specific style or specific ideas that he put down? Well, one concept, I think, that you can see him develop to an absolute art form, that he it was the form that he took in stride, was that of sfumato, which roughly translates to smoke in Italian. Okay. It just kind of means this blurring of light and shadow. If you look at any of da Vinci's artworks, especially works like the Mona Lisa, which he painted towards the end of his life. He wasn't even finished it when he died. You will search your hardest to find a single line in that artwork. Everything's blurry. It has this almost dreamlike quality because he didn't believe in lines. He didn't think that there was such thing as a strict line or division between things. And so in his art, he tr- he, he tends to blur everything and it almost creates this really... I've always looked at works like the Mona Lisa and thought, I just, it looks so calming it looks so natural just there's no harsh light exactly which is ironically enough set him very much apart from michelangelo who was Mm -hmm. originally a sculptor so his lines are very very severe yeah very strict yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is very true i never thought about it like that yeah Mm -hmm. so in his artwork he definitely progressed and developed his own style he did. That wasn't typical of the time oh or my typical gosh. of other artists. No, people sought after his artistry, which is ironic because he wasn't all that, not proud, but he wasn't going around saying everyone, I'm a painter, I'm an amazing painter, I love painting. I would always say that he was a brilliant man who happened to be a painter. It wasn't his first passion? I think it was very much almost an introductory, maybe. He had a natural knack for it, for sure. And I think that was evident when he was very young. But as he grew older, he moved through the world and he would be curious about things like geology or astronomy or engineering or architecture. And of course, he always had painting kind of in the background, almost in like the the dark corners of his mind. I think in the end, it was always something that he could rely on to make a living. But it was never something that he was... Or not never, but I think for the longest time, especially towards the end of his life, it wasn't something that he felt passionate for 100% of the time. Like there's this one woman, Isabel Dest, I think, and she sought after him to paint her picture. She pleaded, she just, she, I think she sent him letter after letter. All I can recall is that she so desperately wanted him to paint her and Leonardo just didn't want to. And because he didn't really want to, he didn't. Was it Leonardo who had the quote of art is never finished, simply abandoned or something like that? 
if it isn't him, I would be surprised. Yeah. Because he, like the Mona Lisa, he, you look at it and it looks so reverent and perfect, but it was unfinished. He started it, I think, in like 1503 and he died in 1519. So he was working on that for about 16 years and it was not finished because he was the worst possible combination. He was a perfectionist, but a procrastinator. And as a university student, I kind of get it. <laughs> I think all university students understand that. Yeah, exactly. He actually ran into problems with a few people who commissioned works from him because he'd be like you know we asked you to do this and it's still not finished it's been a few years and he'd say oh we'll look it around to it eventually like I think there was at one point a monetary dispute if he didn't feel like doing it he wouldn't do it and because he was also a perfectionist it would take him so long to do things that at some point or another he would not feel like doing it we know him chiefly as an artist because we have his paintings and a lot of them you know he gave away or, or some of them were murals like the last supper which is my favorite. It goes back to that Da Vinci Code introduction yes, to Leonardo true. Da Vinci. But that's part of the reason I think why we know him chiefly as an artist, but he was so much more than that. And part of the reason we don't realize that's not common knowledge is because that awful combination of procrastinator and perfectionist, he never did anything incredibly productive outside of art. So he would always plan on making a treatise on, let's say, astronomy or anatomy, but he never got around to doing it. He lost interest or he kept on working on it and then eventually it just went to the dark corners of the mind, it went unfinished. No one ever realized that he was so much more curious than he was. So if in his painting you don't really see the curiosity so much, hmm. how do we know he was curious? What brings that quality about? Oh, so that you would have to look at his notebooks. Yeah. They, if you Google pictures of them, you will just see his mind must have gone at rampant speed. Um, on the same page, you would have a to-do list and it would probably start with something like, go learn a certain math equation. And then it would slowly digress into things like, why is grass green? He, on the same notebook page, would have um, a picture of a seed and then maybe a picture of a man, but then he'd also have strings of an equation. And then he would also make questions regarding fluid dynamics all of this on one single page of, of work. He always kept his eyes looking on the horizon for something. It's not like his mind ever was turned off. He was an observer and he was curious and that prospered so many amazing things. Mm -hmm. And then so much of that is evident in his notebooks. So that's really where we get an idea and a sense of his personality. I, it almost sounds like he's jotting down his innermost thoughts. It almost sounds like very much a journal. It's just a different type of journaling that he's doing. Absolutely. And because he's an artist, he left beautiful journals. They are kind of haphazard and they are kind of all over the place, but they are irrefutably beautiful. And you've already mentioned, so, you know, he would ask, why is the grass green or why, you know, why, why is the, the flower green? pink? Why? Yeah. So he had a curious nature about nature. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He would look at things the way most adults wouldn't. You know, when you're a kid and you ask almost what you would perceive as an adult to be ridiculous questions, there was no such thing as a ridiculous question for Leonardo da Vinci. You know, teachers say there's no such thing as a stupid question. Leonardo, I think, had the same philosophy. He would ask things um, and he would also go searching for answers. So, you know, even though he was a bit of a procrastinator, that didn't stop him from pursuing things. There's this one beautiful depiction in one of his notebooks, and it's actually um, a really fascinating marriage between two aspects of science. And it's a fetus, assumingly in a mother's womb, and halfway through it somehow transforms into a seed. So he had this really active mind. He was constantly finding analogies. Analogies are things that you find all over his works, comparing things and surmising things through those comparisons. He looked at the world in a way that most adults don't. Mm -hmm. You know, he would ask questions one infamous one that one of his biographers constantly refers to is the woodpecker's tongue. Like, what is its function? Where does it go? Does it even have one? But he thought of that. Mm -hmm. He thought of that in a way that most adults wouldn't. It was an insatiable curiosity that he had. And a lot of it could be found in, in the natural world. He covered areas like astronomy and geology. He had this fascination with water. So many of his paintings actually have a little bit of a river in the background, the Mona Lisa does. And mm -hmm. that's something I think people are so perplexed with her face and of course her smile mm -hmm. that we never notice the background of his paintings. But a lot of them from his interests of nature were informed um, when he painted them, he actually took care to include certain types of botany, to include certain types of rock formations. And 
a lot of them actually corresponded. It's not like he had a cactus within a rainforest. <laughs> yeah. You know, he actually took care to include certain things that corresponded with each other in his paintings. And that comes from that observation of the natural world, that curiosity, that, that constant turning of the mind. That is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. You did talk about his engineering. Yeah. So do you know some of the contraptions he's designed? I know some of them weren't actually built, but mm-hmm. they were conceived on the page. Yeah, I think one that there's this one of like a swirling kind of design. I think it meant to do something in the air. That's the one that I think people always kind of remember him for. But there was another, what was it? There was advice that I think he, he sort of built and it was, I think, meant to measure distance. And that was during his time, I believe, when he was following around Cesare Borgia. Oh, he also was commissioned to do, to do this giant horse statue. If it had been completed, it would have been monumental. It would have been glorious. He, you know, Leonardo, he, he was a vegetarian, but he actually dissected horses so we could get an idea of how to craft this horse. And it was a huge engineering feat because, again, it was a huge statue. It wasn't like five feet tall. It was mm-hmm. ginormous. And that was an engineering feat that I think might actually have been complete had it not been for... Um, European invasion into Italy in 1499 because of course the one time he didn't procrastinate yeah this happened there's one that I saw Mm -hmm. when I did a project on the printing press and he designed something that is kind of like the printing press the printing press was like brand new essentially Maybe it was uh, to make it better or to make it different. Maybe. And that's, I mean, and even if it wasn't maybe as efficient as Gutenberg's, Da Vinci was also a painter. He also dissected human beings. He wasn't solely focused on making a a printing press. So Mm -hmm. the fact that he even designed one of his own without relying on anything from Gutenberg, I think is still really impressive. Yeah. He seemed to be very fascinated by engineering in general. Yeah, I think it, it always goes back to that you know, how do things work? Why do they work? Mm-hmm. I think most people are so concerned with the who, what, where, when, why. But Leonardo was really interested in the why. And I think that engineering gave him this this ability to pick things apart, to, to construct things, to see how they worked. And I think for that reason, he made these amazing pageants and performances that was part of his job when he was actually working for, I believe, the Sforza family in Milan. He put on these extravagant shows and because he... He also built, I think, contraptions and, and props through his engineering prowess. Mm-hmm. You know, they were extraordinary shows. So he was a writer. No? Oh, I think I think he was in charge of like the, the stage design oh, and like enhancing the, okay, the show. I never heard he was a writer. Oh god, I don't think yeah. so. <laughs> yeah. He did have interesting writing techniques. I think it was backwards. Mirror. Mirror. I think. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine? It becomes it another type of language, I, w- I would think. I know. If you are somehow trained in looking at Renaissance Italian handwriting and you think you're pretty good at it and then you see Leonardo's, it's like a whole other story. <laughs> you do have to relearn some skills. Oh my goodness, for It's sure. almost like learning a shorthand. Yeah, and he was also, he was left-handed, which was very, I think then as is now, it's quite rare. Mm-hmm. But that's one of the key things people look for when they're trying to decide this new beautiful piece of art you know, that has suddenly resurfaced was a Da Vinci masterpiece is because he left these really distinct hatch marks, mm. which were quite rare because being left-handed was rare. So the left-handed hatch marks are actually a very symbolic sign of a da Leonardo Vinci. da Vinci work. So if it doesn't have that, pff, you can just move on. It's probably yeah. not a Da Vinci work. No. Yeah. I guess a lot of people have tried to emulate him. Yeah, and I think he was so influential. And also, we only have, I think, 17 works by Da Vinci that have either survived or that were probably somewhat close to completion. Because again, he was a procrastinist, or he was a procrastinator, and he was a perfectionist. That's a procrastinist. Yeah, he was a <laughs> procrastinist. Let's make up new words. It all works. It's perfect. It works yeah. for him. One thing that Walter Isaacson, who wrote a book about Da Vinci, pointed out that has always stuck with me was there are some people who say if he hadn't been so distracted with so many other things, you know, if he hadn't started a painting and then suddenly had um, an inspirational revelation about the woodpecker's tongue Mm -hmm. or about some sort of military engineering, you know, technology that he had a concept of or a conceptualization of, then we probably would have had more artwork. And then Walter Isaacson refutes this and says that if he hadn't had so many varying interests, his masterpieces would not have been as remarkable as they were. 
Because when you think about how much goes into creating a piece of art, it's not just looking at something and copying it down. It takes so much skill and, and talent and so much learning. And a lot of what Leonardo did was self-learning. And he was informed by things like optics, perspective, shadow and light. We don't realize just how significant these are when you're creating a painting. And he pursued optics especially because they really did help in his art. They informed him about, you know, how to make things even more realistic. And so without that, we probably wouldn't have that Mona Lisa stare. And if he hadn't been so determined to understand what muscles in the face did what, our facial features, they might not have been as realistic in his paintings as they were. There's this one list he had when conducting his anatomical studies and his anatomical theories. And it was a list of all the facial features he wanted to know the origin of in a way. So he wanted to know what muscles controlled a smile, what muscles controlled anguish, and my favorite is what muscles controlled wonder. If he hadn't paid that close attention, if he hadn't had that perfectionist in him, to know everything about every possible aspect of the world and then reflect that in his paintings, we would not have Da Vinci paintings. And during his lifetime, you've said in his paintings, people were wanting to hire mm -hmm. him and such. So obviously he was popular. Was he much more popular after his death? I think we know for sure that I want to say later on in the century after his death, Vasari, first name I cannot recall, wrote a biography. So I think he was for sure renowned enough where Rosari said, I need to include a biography on this man. I need to write stuff down about him. I think there's always been... Fascination? A, yeah, exactly. But then I think, you know, of course, with the modern day of everyone having access to the internet, type in the Mona Lisa, it's everywhere. If you look at that painting, you know Da Vinci. Mm -hmm. The only problem is, I think, that we don't know how much more he did. Because he actually made some pretty astonishing astronomical queries mm -hmm. during his lifetime because at the time you know of course uh, as we talked about before the renaissance was very much a time where you wanted to honor the works of the past where you didn't necessarily overthrow them at the very most you could try to make new discoveries that would possibly strengthen the, the works of the ancients but as we mentioned leonardo you know because he didn't wasn't taught to necessarily respect and uphold those he didn't mind defying them one such way was through his astronomical studies. He actually wrote down in one of his notebooks on a page something along the lines of the sun does not move. Now in the Renaissance, especially at this particular point in the Renaissance, everyone thought the sun moved. Everyone thought the universe revolved around the earth. Mm -hmm. and this goes back to Aristotelian philosophy and upon that Aristotelian philosophy we had Ptolemaic astronomy. And Ptolemy said, well, of course, according to Aristotle, everything moves around the sun. Mm -hmm. The for earth this... is the center of the universe. Exactly. Mm -hmm. For the super complicated, nasty history of science. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it goes so much deeper than that. But Leonardo, by saying the sun does not move, he was in... He wasn't necessarily laying down the foundations of a whole new no. um, astronomical system, but he was right. And he also, you know, he didn't necessarily um, understand all the dynamics of the universe, but he did know that, for example, the light of the moon was not that the moon itself was emitting light. It was actually a reflection of the sun's light. So things like that, he was able to surmise. And because of his passion for light and shadow, he probably noticed things that somebody else hadn't noticed. Yet. Exactly. He was able to make these leaps, these analogies. I think that really did aid him in all the various areas of interest that he had. And of course, we might have known that he had had such beliefs had he actually published the treatise he'd mentioned wanting to publish on astronomy and a variety of other topics. He never ended up doing it, and that's why we don't... Have we lost know. some of these papers? Did he actually start? Do we know if he started? I think he actually started a few, and I almost, I want to say, don't quote me on this, that I think there were a few drafts, but again, it never got published, and because it never got published, no one ever knew that he'd made these really, really, I'd say, groundbreaking assertions. It was similarly with the aortic valve. He made this discovery, I want to say, about the aortic valve. He didn't go further with it. And of course, he wasn't right completely in, in the whole scheme of things. But he made this really important observation about the heart based on his studies of water. So there we have, again, another analogy. But nothing ever came of it. And that the same discovery was not officially made public until the 1960s. 450 years later and because this was something he'd conceptualized around the 1510s he just hadn't procrastinated 
the medical field back then mm-hmm. in the 14, 1500s, mm-hmm. they were still very primitive to some degree compared to what we have now, mm-hmm. meaning they didn't mm-hmm. understand quite everything. Yeah. Still very patriarchal, yeah. so the women's bodies were a mystery, and they had lots of theories about that. Oh, they did, and they also weren't allowed to examine bodies the way we are now. Autopsies were a big no-no, probably for religious reasons. It was not something you did. You didn't cut up people after they died. Mm-hmm. Um, you were to respect them. But Leonardo actually had quite rare, when you think about it, access. He was able to look at these bodies, and... It doesn't sound like an honor or it doesn't sound amazing. That he had part. access essentially to medical things that other people didn't have. And you know where most people would shy away from that? Again, we have that stringent pursuit um, that needs to satiate answers. his curiosity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the curiosity is a huge theme with him. Oh my gosh, yes. I honestly think if he could have somehow been given the knowledge of every single thing and being on this earth, he would have then said, okay, what about the next planet over? <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. would have always looked a little further. Exactly. I don't think it was for any malicious reason. It wasn't mm-hmm. so he could find the secrets to the life and universe and then Just use it. Just very curious it. mind. Exactly. With his curiosity, he also had that childlike element. Yes. And he also had a very mature brain. Yeah, you know what he did? He was able to use that childlike imagination as like a springboard. Mm -hmm. And then he would use this wisdom that he had. And he would then make really intelligent leaps between them. And then like I was saying with the analogies, he could look at something and say, well, these same principles apply to things in flight. I wonder if these same principles apply to things in water. He was able to use that imagination as a stepping stone. He was able to pose questions. And through his intellect, he was able to find answers. I feel like if somebody has this innate curiosity, no matter how much you feed it, Mm -hmm. it just keeps growing. Exactly. And you know what? One thing that Walter Isaacson mentioned, I think in the introduction of his book, was that Leonardo da Vinci is such a fascinating figure because when you look at his life, you think that he is such a genius. Who, aside from a genius can do art, who can make paintings, and and also um, create instruments, which he did. He created these beautiful, almost fantasial instruments. Like mm-hmm. they, they looked like works out of a fantasy. Did he create them physically or just in his notebook? I, I, wanna, I know he made beautiful drawings of them. They mm-hmm. were gorgeous. But he, at the very least, considered music, and, and who could also do things for military engineering and cartography. So it's so easy to think of him as a genius. But one thing Walter Isaacson says is that he had the kind of genius that was almost attainable. Because it wasn't like he was just born with this ability to process complex equations like, say, Albert Einstein. But he had that curiosity. One thing that I've always adored about Leonardo was that curiosity. Because I think it's quite possibly the best quality that human beings can have. Just that need to know solely for the sake of knowing. Because I think once you try to apply that knowledge, then it gets all muddled and and messy. But I think just knowing something for the sake of knowing something is such a human quality. And I think he's the epitome of that. He's the model of curiosity gone right. And he's left us with so many good things to look at. Yeah. There has been a book that was published, I think, last year. And it's his journal, but Mm. sort of put together in a pleasant way to read it. That sounds awesome. Yes, and I don't remember where I read that article, but I remember them either talking about doing it and publishing it or it has been published. That was a really cool thing to see. They finally have bound them in one location. Yeah. He was so unabashedly himself. He would, mm-hmm. he didn't try to make his notebooks neat and orderly and the work of a sophisticated, learned, very proud man. If he wanted to draw a picture of a bird, he drew a picture of a bird. And if he wanted to write a funny little poem, he wrote a funny little poem. And if it was a little inappropriate, it was a little inappropriate. But if it was really philosophically um, profound, sure enough. The more you talk about it, the more it feels like somebody who's just jotting down things as they're thinking about it or as they're considering it. Yeah, and you'll even find like to-do lists in there. I think something he just carried around with him. If he needed to write something down, if he needed to draw something, if he had a question he needed answering, he'd put it in that notebook. I wonder if he followed up on some of these. Oh, I think he for sure did. Or at the very least, he tried to. Because as I mentioned earlier, he didn't learn Latin. That wasn't part of his language. He went to an abacus school. I guess it was a basic education at the time. But he did try to learn Latin. He tried really, really hard. Did it work out? No. But we're all human, (laughs) even Leonardo. It's an instance of it not turning out very well whatsoever. So he wasn't successful in learning Latin, finally. 
No, I think I think yeah. every person has their limits, and I think <laughs> his mind said from everything from the stars to the rocks. Just me, you don't know Latin. Live with it. <laughs> His interest in botany is fascinating because he doesn't know Latin and mm-hmm. people were giving these names, these yeah. la- very Latin names to these mm-hmm. different groups of botanical objects. He learned, I think, a little bit. My teachers just really tried to teach me French. Mm-hmm. And to this day, the only thing in French that I know how to say is uh, je ne parle pas français. Mm-hmm. It was all I need to know. So I think he must have picked up probably a little bit of Latin along the way. Mm-hmm. Hopefully. Enough to get by um, oh, whatever topic he wanted to learn. Yeah, because, you know, even though he didn't always correspond with the works of um, the Latin Philosophers West. Philosophers yeah, and scientists. He did refer to them. And, of course, he needed them to build upon his own work. He needed to know what other people said before him to then launch off of that. And so I think he must have learned a little bit of Latin. Enough to get by. But he didn't need it. I think he was just happy looking at bugs. I don't need yeah. the name. I just want to observe it. Yeah, exactly. There's the curiosity. Yeah. One of my favorite stories of Leonardo da Vinci was how he surmised like vision periphery or how, how he was able to discern vision input. And it was he took a needle, and I'm pretty sure this is da Vinci, and he took a needle and he slowly brought it closer and closer to a person's eye. Because they had originally thought that vision all came in through one tiny part of the pupil. And so he brought it closer and closer and he said, can you still see? Can you still see? And the person kept on being able to see out of the periphery, no matter how close the needle got. And so from that, he was able to say, oh, so vision comes from more than just this one tiny spot in the pupil. It comes from all over the pupil. So kind of a scary experiment. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be that person. <laughs> yeah, the worst horror movie you can yeah. think of is that big needle oh coming gosh. from your eye. I don't get paid enough for this. No. <laughs> There better be a good reward. (laughs) He had such a diverse way of looking at things. I mean, his art had a lot of physics in it and a Mm -hmm. lot of science in Mm -hmm. it, like the botany and the light. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a lot of the things that he's learned Mm -hmm. throughout his life Mm -hmm. were very useful when he was painting. They were. They absolutely were. And I think that dire need to include everything that he knew into his works. It was a beautiful thing. It could also be a stressful thing. And again, Mm -hmm. it has to do with that perfectionist um, aspect of his personality. And we see artworks like, for example, the uh, Adoration of the Magi, where, you know, he wanted to make it the best possible painting it could be. And what he had painted was absolutely gorgeous, but he got so caught up in trying to paint perfectly um, these 50 characters in this painting that eventually was never complete. And I think part of that was because he got so stressed with trying to make it so perfect to include the physics, to include um, the perspective and the geometry that eventually got to be too much. And so there are a lot of instances where I think he got so overwhelmed with all that knowledge he had, but other instances where they did accumulate to produce beautiful, gorgeous artworks like the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper and the Lady with an Ermine. So in your opinion, why do you think it's important that we know about Leonardo da Vinci? Besides knowing Mona Lisa when you Google it. I mean, there's so many reasons. But one that's always resonated with me, again, is that I think even though he was an artist, and that's Mm -hmm. something we know him to be, um, there were so many more layers uh, towards his character. And even though there were all those layers that sometimes seemed to go against the artistic aspect of his personality, everything informed each other. One might have a difficult time trying to make connections between anatomy and optics and uh, botany and art. He made it all work. He was able to look at the human condition in the natural world and he was able to portray it almost seamlessly in his art. He was a bit of a rebel. He was. He absolutely was in the (laughs) coolest way. He was a cool rebel. See, that's how I feel about Beethoven. (laughs) He was such a cool rebel. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. There's some really neat figures during this time. We also like to learn about women. Mm -hmm. We, both as women, but Uh, we historians also really like to learn about women during the time. There's less information. Do we have any information about Leonardo and women around him, either artists or he ever married, obviously? Well, you know, one thing I will say, though, is that... He, of course, he did paint you know, various women. We have the Mona Lisa. Of course. And then we also have um, a lady with an ermine. Mm-hmm. And there's one other thing. It's the Principess or something of the sort. And, you know, Leonardo, when he wanted to paint, he painted. And when he didn't want to paint, he didn't want to paint. And if he liked the subject or if he didn't like his subject was also really important. And the fact that he painted those women mm-hmm. meant that he found inspiration in them. They were people he wanted to paint. If he didn't want to, if he didn't care, he wouldn't do it. But he painted the Mona Lisa for 16 years. I'm sure he was fiddling with it. 
Oh, my, like, constantly, constantly. Mm-hmm. And he would put layer of varnish after varnish after varnish on it, which is part of the problem that we have today because he put another coating that you put on paintings when you're not finished it yet. It's what you put between layers. Mm-hmm. And he never put that final coat on it. And so keeping the Mona Lisa in one piece is a lot it's of work because he never finished anything and he was really innovative with the kind of materials he used to which poses another problem because we cannot treat his works the way we treat other things because he was so innovative and in the kinds of paints that he used and the, i believe he did have his own paints he also i believe put a certain layer of something underneath the last supper because the last supper is actually a mural it's not like a canvas or a, it's not, not a piece of canvas or wood and when most painters paint on a wall they put a certain layer of something underneath it dries slowly and of course you can't like put it on afterwards so you need to do it all in one go as we know he was a procrastinist he didn't want to paint the last supper in one go he wanted to take his time with it and so he didn't use that under that final coating underneath it and because of that it's having a real hard time staying on that wall i don't envy those so art historians oh mm-hmm. imagine the weight on your shoulders trying to keep the mona lisa together yeah, yeah. you can't let that one go no <laughs> <laughs> no He painted the Last Supper mural. Do we know of any other paintings he did as murals, or had they been covered up? I'm pretty sure there was another one that was commissioned by the Florentine government. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Unfinished. Yeah. Like, they painted him to do one. They painted another artist to do another one. I think it might have actually been Michelangelo, Mm -hmm. who was supposed to paint the other one. Leonardo didn't finish his. (laughs) No no shocker there. Yeah. It was like a battle scene, but he never ended up finishing it. It I think part of it was because memory recalls he got stressed over it. Because mm-hmm. one thing with The Last Supper is you don't realize looking at it, but there were some real perspective challenges. Oh, coming absolutely. Because it was painted above a doorway. It's not painted at eye mm-hmm. level. And so in order to make it look seamlessly um, painted onto the wall and from the perspective with which you walk into the room and then stand in front of it and how it was higher than what other paintings would normally be, he put a lot of work into making it look right. A lot of painters at the time trying to work with what was there it would have been really hard but he put so much um effort into that perspective and that optics aspect of it and he was having a difficult time with that other mural can't make it work can it, if it can't make it work if it can't be perfect i don't want to do it i think he, if he believed in a project he put his heart and soul into it like with the Mona Lisa. and if he didn't well then he just wasn't ready for it exactly mm-hmm. so i've asked this with a few people and i'll preface this by saying if you had a time machine yeah but the rules are you can't die unless you jump off a cliff yeah you know, you know the language you're not an outsider yes. okay so put that as if you were just part of the culture at that point yes if you had a time machine and you could go back what would be the moment in da vinci's life that you'd kind of want to peek over his shoulder or, or be his apprentice or whatnot mm-hmm what would be sort of your favorite thing oh. that he's done that you're kind of like, hmm, that'd be really neat to see or really need to be yeah. part of that? I think it would probably be in the period in Milan, his first one. And I think he started there 1482. So any time between 1482 and 1499, I think he was really... You know, he'd established his own form of art, but he also wasn't at that old age where things started to go a bit downhill. So I think I think in many ways that was his prime. He was given, I'd say, fair enough freedom to pursue whatever he wanted. And I think it was a really brilliant intellectual point in his life where he just felt as though he could... And it was, you know what, it was before the Mona Lisa, but you know what, I think I could go to the Louvre and see that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't need to see it being made. It was a really great time in his life. I mean, the Sforzas weren't wonderful people because mm-hmm. that was who they were working for, but I mean, I think they gave him enough license to just go at it. And if you were to pick Leonardo and you were to put him in another timeline, oh, what would be an interesting place to put him where you think he would flourish or he would develop differently? This is a historian question because yeah. I know Ooh. you know your history. Yeah. Would you put him backwards into with the Greeks or the Romans or even the Egyptians or would you put him a little forward? Honestly, I just love to sit him down at a computer <laughs> and <laughs> see what he can do. <laughs> yeah. I just like I, I think that would be so fascinating for him to just hop forward to the present day, just see everything because I think we know so much more than they did, and I think that would excite him. Purely, absolutely. I think he'd, he'd be That's so ecstatic. Answer. Like to look at an airplane and say, how does it do that? <laughs> and look at modern cars too. I think it would just blow his mind. And then he would then turn to the most brilliant scientists in the world and go, well, what about this? Let me help you. (laughs) 
And you've mentioned to me prior to the recording that you actually had a really fun quote that you love, love, love in the Isaacson book. Yes, I do. One of many. But this is... (laughs) Let's pick one. Yeah, this is this one. So it's a bit of a long one, so hold on. That's okay. We cannot portray him with crisp, sharp lines, nor should we want to, just as he would not have wanted to portray Mona Lisa that way. There is something nice about leaving a little to our imagination. As he knew, the outlines of reality are inherently blurry, leaving a hint of uncertainty that we should embrace. The best way to approach his life is the way he approached the world, filled with a sense of curiosity and an appreciation for its infinite wonders. That's fantastic. I think it just encompasses his art, it encompasses who he was as a person. So when Isaacson wrote this book, is this a fairly new biography? I want to say 2017. Mm-hmm. And she's looking it up now. Yeah. <laughs> 2017. So it's a fairly recent biography. So he must have amalgamated a lot of information from a lot of different sources. It took him years. Mm-hmm. Years. Because when you think about it, you know, he lived in, he was born in Vinci, lived in Florence, um, lived in Milan and Rome and, you know, Milan again and then France. So he was all over the place. He left evidence of him I think everywhere he went mm-hmm. and he traveled more with Cesare Borgia of all people like he was all over the map and so I think tracking down all his records and then of course tracing everywhere he went because you know I feel like when you're writing about someone as important as Leonardo you want to actually see the places he saw the the sites that he witnessed it's a lot of work that goes into this brilliant biography well we'll definitely be linking that in the show notes yeah the version you brought today is actually fantastic. It's a beautiful hardcover, yes. which is always my favorite type. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was a gift, which has that much more meaning. Exactly. So that's really special. It was someone who knew I, I loved Da Vinci and gave me an opportunity to learn more about him. Yeah, that's yeah. always wonderful. Yeah. Well, Emma, I mean, I think we've went around quite a bit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> trying to figure out who Da Vinci yeah. was. And I still think he's really cool. <laughs> oh my gosh, he, he is... One of my favorite historical figures, if mm-hmm. not the the yeah. historical figure. Yeah, it's hard to pick. There's a lot. Yeah, but, there's a know. reason he's known as the Renaissance man. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I think that he is definitely one of the most well known. Yes. And he has left a significant mark on the art world, on the engineering world. Mm-hmm. So he touches so many different areas with mm-hmm. all of his life and all of his mm-hmm. works. And I think any listener at this point can get a little tidbit here and there and pick something that interests them and hopefully can pick up, you know, where we left off. Absolutely. Because we didn't say everything. Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> so, so thank you again. I, I'm really, really happy you're able to come. I know your schedule is really busy, so. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Now, as you have all heard, Emma is absolutely passionate about Leonardo da Vinci and the book she kept referencing and that you have to see because by the way, I saw it, it's absolutely gorgeous, is called Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson. And of course, she did mention The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, which would be my fiction. You can check it out, the links in the show notes, and you can visit the website for more information. In case you didn't know, you can catch me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at History A. And you can rate me on iTunes or your podcasting platform. And I want to thank my husband, Jamie, our brood of kids, our family, our friends. Without them, I wouldn't be adventuring through history. Un grand merci. Oh, it's all good. There's no there's no voicemail so I have to wait until